and um, and I'll pull up the uh, the hearing notice. Oh goodness, yeah. Sometimes when they update stuff, it's nice. Hmm. Nate, I like your home office. Oh yeah, you like that? That's, that's yeah. my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get away from the kids and everybody? It's the only place we have like a kind of an open house. So it's like if I'm in the living room, it would be pretty pretty tough. I thought I thought if we bored you, you would just take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. I can just lay down and there I go. Make sure it's neat in there though. Gosh, you know what? I, yeah, I know I upgraded just a minute ago and I've lost all my controls. Um, oh, 39 participants. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Let me make you a, um, a co-host. Okay. A co-host. Yeah. We have a number of attendees, 33 attendees, including, and then 39 total with the committee and myself. And, and sorry, I'm looking around this. Is this there, is just um, is, there was no agenda sent out for this. There was, you know, it's just the it's the public hearing and then the um, the recommendation. So I was trying to share my screen, and my um, I didn't realize I was an, I was I was forced to upgrade today. Oh, that was a Zoom issue. It was, and now um, anyways, oh, share screen. There we are. Now I can see it. Perfect. All panelists, all, yep, okay. Thanks everyone. I, here's the uh, public hearing notice. As I was saying, there was no new proposals. Um, I can describe a little bit for everyone who's an attendee. You know, this is structured as a webinar. So the committee is considered panelists and they can see each other and myself, I'm staff liaison to the committee. And then the, um, the attendees, you can hear and hopefully see the screen, but you might not be able to see each other. Um, so there's about 30 of 30 attendees. And the, um, we can go down the list of proposals again and ask for any um, brief comments or updates. And we, you know, as Gail had done last time, we can ask people to raise their hand in Zoom. There's a, I think if you hover over your name, you can click raise hand and we can, um, allow you to speak. And so as proposals are being presented, we promote um, you know, representatives from the agency to a panelist so then they can speak freely with the committee and there can be discussion back and forth. The, um, this hearing is being recorded and ends up being put on the town's YouTube channel as, the, as was the previous one. The, um, I think that's it. Gail, do you have anything you'd like to add or? Uh, Gail, you're muted. I know. Hi, can you hear me now? Um, I think for the sake of time and given the fact that we had a lot of letters of support, we've heard already from all these organizations, if people have um, the desire and would like to make comments that they limit it to three to five minutes. So sure. that we, we, I mean, unless there's any really um, salient new information that's different than what we read in our reports that we heard last week. So we ask that everyone limit their comments to three to five minutes, uh, preferably way under five. Sure. Should we just go down the list again and see if there's any new comments? Sure. And can everyone see the screen, the list of proposals in the table? Great. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for Valley CDC, if you want to raise your hand, um, if you would like to speak, I see Joanne. I can promote you to panelists. And is anyone else here from Valley CDC? Just hi, Joanne. Uh, hi, how are you all? Uh, so I just I just want to again uh, promote the. Um, proposal that the town and valley are uh, hoping to get funded to support the small business community um, and you know how dire the need is for uh, all our small businesses in the whole region um, and so um, we're hoping that uh, we can keep the budget um, at 200 or even more um, potentially uh, to help small businesses in the amherst region thanks Thank you, Joanne. I, I was going to just say that, you know, we, Joanne and I and Valley had talked over email and we said, you know, it was discussed at the last hearing if Valley would accept 250,000. 
And I think there's the need for that. So it's really the committee's discretion, but you know, the, I think there's a need for more. It all depends on how the financial recommendations work out given the, the maximum of $400,000. So, you know, that was a question. And, you know, just to say that, that, you know, there is a need for that if it, if, you know, if there needs to be money put to more money put to this activity. Um, looks like someone is raising their hand. It's like Dave Zomax raising his hand. Gail, I'll let him speak. Sure. Hi, Dave. You're welcome to speak. Yep. We don't see you though. No, yeah. he's in attendance still. Hey, Dave. Okay. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I'll be very brief. I know you have a, a, a big agenda. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what uh, Joanne uh, mentioned about the, um, the micro business proposal that uh, Valley and the town uh, collaborated on. Uh, just the importance of the program. Um, all of us recognize the, you know, the, the need for uh, other funding or funding to be shared with service agencies uh, and the uh, whole business community. Um, but I just wanted to kind of make that link that you know, if we can help businesses stay open, uh, to uh, reopen, to get people back to work, all of that has a trickle down effect and, and uh, helps families stay afloat and stay uh, prosperous uh, and get back to work. So we're excited to collaborate with Valley and we hope that the committee um, sees value in this, um, in this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being brief. <laughs> I'm not sure there's any other comments right now for Valley's proposal. Joanne, if you're all set, I'll just, I'll make you an attendee again. And I think that's it right now. Are there any other questions for, from the committee? Okay, well, I guess you know, what we should do is let's do a roll call attendance just to make sure everyone knows who's here. Okay. From the CDBG committee. Yes. Yeah. Just so uh, all right. People listening can hear. Uh, uh, Gail Lansky. I'm here. Okay. Nat Larson. Andrew Grant Thomas. Thanks, Andrew. Paul. Paul, can you un unmute yourself? Paul Goulston. Great. Keith. Keith cool. Nesbitt. Great. Thanks, everyone. Just so we have it. Nate Malloy, staff liaison, just so everyone knows. All right. Should we can continue down the list? Sure. All right. Family Outreach of Amherst. If, all right. Laura, I'm promoting you to panelist. Laura, I think you're all set to speak. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I, all I really want to say is that uh, I talked to Francine Rodriguez, our program manager yesterday, and as of the end of the day yesterday, we had seven new calls, uh, all seeking help with housing, um, and none of them we knew. They were all new people. So um, we're getting, I just wanted to reiterate that we're getting a lot of calls and we're getting and we're getting um, the majority of calls are for people we have never met before, which is pretty significant, I think. Great, thanks, Laura. I'll, I'll also say that I forwarded the committee, you know, there was probably like half a dozen uh, support letters as well that describe your program and uh, the people's support for, uh, for your proposal. Great. Does the committee have any more questions? I, I actually do, on an average day, how many calls would you be getting for housing? Be all, before all this? Yes. I would say we get three to five a week. Okay. So. Thank you. Anybody else from the committee have a call, question for Laura? I think I'll just mention too that I'd, I had asked, um, you know, there was a three um, proposals for you know, some housing assistance. And I asked if, if, for instance, Family Outreach would be willing to help, um, you know, individuals as well. Laura indicated they'd help anyone seeking housing support. So although it's, you know, Family Outreach of Amherst, they'd help, you know, individuals or, 
those at risk of homelessness. So it's, you know, it wasn't, it wouldn't be just families, um, just so that's, that's clear. Yeah, anybody who calls and asks us for help, we're going to help. Absolutely. Great. Yep. Anybody else have a question for Laura? Okay. Thank you, Laura. Bye. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Are there any attendees who have a, would like to speak on behalf of Family Outreach? You can raise your hand. I'm not sure. Are there? I'm not sure there are any, but. No, I didn't tell people to. No, that's, that's fine. All right, great. I don't see any raised hands right now. Thanks, Laura. I'm going to make you an attendee again. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Andrew. I I am um, sorry. Sorry to be doing this. I realized I actually did have a question for Valley CDC. Sure. Uh, I can. Um, I'll let me pull Joanne back in. Oh, all right. Joanne is uh is back with us. Yeah, sorry. But thank you, Joanne. Um, uh, I think, yes, yeah, so as I remember, in, in, your, in the proposal, there was reference to a previous $125,000 grant, right, where you've yes. done some similar work in Northampton. And right. um, as a, I think the, yeah, the grant amount was, you know, $5,400 was the average grant amount that you did under that previous award. Uh, and you mentioned a, a $1,087 sort of administrative fee per grant Correct. and 23 grants. So by my math, that came up to about $149,000, but you had a $125,000 grant to do that work. We actually, the we had a $25,000 contract with the city for our administrative expenses. I see. And um, 125 that was direct grant money. I see. So the right. So the the twenty five thousand dollars paid for all the administrative yes. side of things. Wonderful. That explains it. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, Gail. Should we go down the list and? Um, yep. Amherst Community Connections Connection. would be next. Sure. I'm sorry. Just move my computer. Sorry, my computer is. There we are. All right, Wayling, you're promoted to panelist. Wayling, if you unmute yourself, you'd be able to speak to the committee. Got it. Hi, thank you so much for having me here again. And uh, the new information I'd like to add is that uh, the raft has been such a hot cake. Everybody is applying for raft. So because of the funding is available and the town of Amherst emergency funds also was very available. We got an email from the administrator of the, uh, uh, the town of Amherst emergency fund. So they had a deadline of June 4th, which is today. So we had quite a bit of referrals activities there. So we are very happy to say that uh, because the funding is available, so we are able to get people linked up to move into uh, their housing or to prevent uh, their utility being shut off. So it's wonderful to see funding available. That way it make our work just much more meaningful. So um, I want to say that keep the money coming. That way we are able to produce uh, results without you know, struggling just to patch together funding for those who are struggling. So um, with that said, I don't have any new information to add other than saying we can see the depth of the needs in the community is so much uh, deeper than it has been before the COVID-19 and uh, the need uh, to secure employment because of un high unemployment rate. So people are getting very nervous to find out where their next uh, rent is going to be coming from after the July 30th, the extra $600 that they are going to get if they are unemployed. So all these add to the stress in addition to the current you know, uh, racial inequality. And uh, we have some participants, they are people of color and they are really, really very stressed out. So I want to emphasize the political climate 
has added to this economic stress. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. <clears throat> I was going to just say one thing too, um, as I did with family outreach, I asked Amherst Community Connections if they would help, you know, families and individuals and Wailing responded that they would help, you know, anyone looking for housing support. So it's not, you know, one or the other, it's, it's really both or any, you know, anyone really. So. Correct. Correct. And, and I have a question. You called it a raft, R-A-F-T grant? Right. So that's, I mean, that's a, those are, I can, sorry, I'll, I'll that's, you, you know, a rapid rehousing um, okay. program. So it's administered by regional authorities. So Wayfinders okay. um, uh, it administers it for this area. And so it's, you know, some of the money that went to DHCD went to the, the RAAs, the regional um, administrators. And so they have money to give out and, um, you know, RAF typically has their own set of guidelines. So, it, but it is um, funding for housing costs. Thank you. Anybody else from the committee have a question for Wei Ling? I do. Okay, Paul, go ahead. So I <clears> have <throat> two questions. On, on the budget, there is uh, income from the United Way and income from the Community Foundation of Western Mass. Is that uh, still, are you still getting that uh, funding? I wish we were getting it because of the COVID-19. We had, very, we had received a wonderful review and uh, both, uh, both entities, they were very positive about our proposal because they knew that we had gotten some money from the town. So they were you know, really considering us. But unfortunately, when COVID-19 hit, they both had to reallocate their funding to other sources. So therefore, this year, they have suspended their uh, funding of uh, current uh, proposals. So therefore we are being pushed up onto next year. So right now we have a hole of $47,000 as a result of neither of them is able to uh, e evaluate, review any proposals that came to them this year. So I am sorry to inform you that that's why we were so happy when we saw the COVID-19 uh, CARES Act uh, CDBG grant we thought we would jump in to ask you for help. Okay, so on the budget, it shows a $459 uh, surplus, and actually it's a $44, $47,000 deficit. So it would that, be a, about a 40, you know, $46,500 $46, deficit, yeah. Yeah. And we are doing extra fundraising. So right now we have put together a GoFundMe if you go to our Amherst Community Connections website, you will see some real stories of real people, their needs and how we were able to help them on our website. And we are doing something called uh, COVID-19 uh, fundraising right on our website. And uh, so far we have had wonderful responses. People are really uh, trying to share their blessings, their you know, good fortune with those in need of assistance. So we are really, making money every place we can to sustain our work. And how does RAFT work? Um, is that money given like to your agency or is it directly uh, applied by the uh, participant? Well, this is how RAFT work because it's a program administered by Wayfinders and it has its own set of rules and regulations. It's very cumbersome. So for the past uh, six months, we have had Wayfinders come to our office before COVID-19 to have a representative, uh, Ms. Judith Cardona. She is the RAFT administrator. So she came to our office on every Wednesday morning from 8.30 to 12.30, and we refer our participants directly to her. So we have a list of people who want to see her. So we schedule the appointment. So instead of people going to Springfield, to Northampton from Amherst looking for a raft representative to apply for funding, we take out the transportation barrier. So therefore they are meeting with the raft administrator, Ms. Judith Cardona. So therefore the funding process has been streamlined and people who are behind on rent or utility, they can get the support right away without going through the 
uh, Springfield or the uh, other you know, towns that they have to get a bus, which is very cumbersome, challenging for them. So the money doesn't come to us, but rather the money is administered by wayfinders and they can pay for utility arrears. They can pay for uh, moving costs, such as the first month, last month, and security deposit. And they can also pay for uh, mortgage arrears as well. So their range of financial support is much greater than any source that I know of. So it's very wonderful to have the agency uh, stationed right at our office. And we had to rent a separate uh, office space for them to allow them to do their work. And that was at our own expense when we had the representative came here. So are they still coming uh, the last couple of months? Have they been coming? No, they have. Uh, their policy is that their workers have been working remotely. So this is what we do. We do tele-support to all our participants. So instead of them coming to see us, that we fill the form for them for raft application, we would do the um, telephone uh, support, do phone conferencing. So through this technology, Zoom meeting, we are able to help them fill out the assessment online application form and submit it to RAFT. And then we would email RAFT to ask them to set up a meeting. So along the way, we are able to help uh, streamline the process and make the result come faster rather than later. So this is a collaboration that we are able to build. And uh, uh, homeless healthcare for the homeless is some, something similar people who don't have physicians. We also bring a physician in before COVID-19. And Dr. Bossi comes on Tuesdays from 8.30 to 12.30. And she also works with our participants who have no medical health care. And because of her work, we are able to help people apply for priority emergency housing for those who are homeless. So just to bring the service providers on site, we are able to help people achieve their housing stability and self-sufficiency economically in a very you know, seamless way, rather than going from one agency to another. So this is truly a one-stop resource center, collaborating with resources that people will benefit from. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question, Paul. Anybody else from the committee have a question for Wei Lang? Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Wei Ling had said, though, about RAF. So the money doesn't, the agent, the administering agency, Wayfinders, won't give money out to other agencies that, you know, an individual or a household has to apply to them. And then they work with the tenant or the homeowner and, you know, and make payments to them. So it's not as if, you know, these agencies have money and they give them out to other agencies and individual communities. It's, you know, you have to funnel applicants to them. Thank you. Okay, Wei Ling. Yeah, I was gonna yes. say, are there any, any public attendees who wanna speak? I did not ask anybody to come. Oh, sure, well, no, thanks, Wei Ling. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Can everyone still see the screen? So it looks like we're um, now down to the literacy project. And Judith, I'll promote you to panelist. Hey, Judith, if you unmute yourself, you'll be able to speak. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just um, wanted to say that um, thank you for the opportunity to apply for funding. And I Literacy Project applied for our online. We're unable to meet in-person classes because of the pandemic and so we applied for some support for our online learning and um, also many of our students are out of work and need access to um, what we traditionally call the GED, we now call it the high set diploma in order to enter into the job training programs, especially the programs that have jobs now available um, relative to <coughs> pandemic, nursing aides, jobs, and EMTs, et cetera. 
um, that are important jobs to be filled and our students are available um, but need to have the high school equivalency diploma first. That's why we're here. And I also wanted to say that the Literacy Project partners with um, the Career Center, Franklin Hampshire Career Center, Holyoke Community College and Greenfield Community College. And we transition our students into programs, job training programs at those locations. Um, we also partner with the Amherst Survival Center, the Family Outreach Center, and Domestic Violence Prevention of the PVPC program that are listed right here. So we are all working together to support the vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Does anybody have a question um, from the panel for Judith? No? Okay. And Nate, you want to see if, if there's anybody else out there on behalf of the Literacy Project that would like to speak? Sure. If you're an attendee, you can raise your hand. I'm not sure if there is any. Okay. I didn't there's, invite anyone today. <laughs> and thanks, Judith. I just, just for the committee, just so everyone's aware, right? Um, um, the Literacy Project updated their funding request. So right. you know, oh, yeah. on, the, on the table. I also made a typo in my updated funding request on page three. Um, instead of writing the Amherst Adult Learning Center, I wrote where. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. All right, thanks, Judith. Thank you. I'll move Judith to attendee again. It looks like we're moving down to um, uh, Amherst Survival Center. And Lev, I'm going to make you a panelist. Um, and you can let me know who else you'd like to speak. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, appreciate you having us back. Um, I was able to speak at the hearing last week about the Amherst Survival Center's request for $100,000 in CDBG coronavirus funds to ensure the food security of 3,000 Amherst residents. And I spoke at that point about the record unemployment and just the compounding needs that we're really seeing families facing as they're navigating food insecurity and unemployment um, and this health crisis that we have. So I won't reiterate all of that, but I just wanted to take um, a minute or two today to share an additional comment um, as I urge the committee to consider our application in full. And I, I wanna specifically highlight the criteria for social services that is set out for DHCD for this COVID specific round of funding. Um, according to their notice of funding award, they're evaluating these applications according to community needs, scale and impact, budget and value and capacity to deliver. And what I really see here is a tremendous match between what the Emmer Survival Center is proposing to do, what we know the community needs, and what we're seeing in this particular award that, the, that DHCD is looking to support towns and cities across the state to deliver. So first, when it comes to community need, Food security was a critical public health crisis prior to COVID, and that has been exacerbated. Um, I shared last week that we continue to see three to four times the number of new families registering for our food pantry for the very first time. As far as scale and impact, with the funding proposed, the Amherst Survival Center is going to be able to dramatically scale our food pantry programs. We're proposing to double the amount of food that we provide to every family and to increase the number of Amherst residents served by 50% to 3,000 Amherst residents. As far as budget and value, this proposal really offers an incredible value that we hope will strengthen the town's proposal as a whole. Our proposed expanded pantry services cost only $91 per Amherst resident per year. That's less than $8 a month for up to two weeks of groceries, either picked up or delivered to someone's door. And only half of that is CDBG funds. 
we're leveraging volunteers and who continue to show up amidst this crisis and donated food and other funding sources and the resources of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. And so we're looking to the committee to help secure the federal funds that are really needed to take this project to the last mile um, and provide that, that funding needed to fully execute. And lastly, the capacity to deliver. I believe that the Emmer Survival Center has demonstrated this capacity over many years, but surely over the last three months, the incredible staff and volunteers here have demonstrated the capacity of the organization to respond in real time to the new needs that we're seeing. In a matter of weeks, we were made operations. We've now doubled lunch service. We have added pantry delivery, um, whereas pre-COVID we delivered to around 50 Amherst seniors. Uh, last month, we delivered to more than 250 Amherst residents, um, 550 residents across our service area. We have launched online registration. We've built new partnerships. We found new vendors to purchase food from. So in May of 2020, our food pantry distributed 45,000 meals worth of groceries compared with 26,000 meals in May of 2019. We're ready to do this. We're ready to double the food provided from pre-COVID levels. We're ready to serve more people. We're really ready to address the barriers that people are facing to improve access through delivery, to expand our on-site hours for evenings and weekends to support residents who are returning to work. And um, our staff and volunteers are ready and able to see this through. And so we're really looking to the committee for your support to secure the federal funds that are needed to get us there. Thanks, Lev. I also Thank you. wanted to say that I, um, I forwarded a sample of letters that were sent to the town manager and noted that there's been many letters of support sent on behalf of the Survival Center and Food Pantry to the town and the committee. So they've seen some of those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, while I uh, believe there may be some supporters of the Amherst Survival Center's proposal on the call, in respect to the committee's time, we asked people um, to submit their comments in writing in advance of the meeting. So those were the letters that you've received. So there aren't any other representatives from the center planning to speak. All right, oh, thanks. Thank you, thank you for those letters that we got. Absolutely, thank you very much for your consideration. Any panelists have a question for Lev? <clears throat> okay. And right. no one from the community. All right, thanks, Lev. I'll make you an attendee again. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Craig's doors. Let's see, Kevin. Sorry. Hi, Kevin. I'm promoting you to panelist. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with you again, and uh, we can't uh, we can't emphasize enough the need I to reduce. I think he's still muted. Oh, I am I? No. Maybe oh, I'm. I'm hearing him certainly. Okay. Is everybody else? Yeah, may, yeah. Maybe if you turn up your your microphone a little bit, though, it sound you sound a little distant or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how's that? That sounds good. Is that is that better? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, uh, again, because of COVID-19, we, we want to reemphasize the importance of reducing the shelter population and getting them into some sort of housing arrangement, probably a shared arrangement since they have little to no income. We want to make sure that we have enough to accommodate people through the winter months and the size of the facility that we worked with last year, the First Baptist Church, isn't going to be able to be expanded. So we need to make sure that there are fewer people coming in. We're probably talking about reducing it almost by half uh, during the winter months. So our job this summer is to try and get as many people housed as possible. That's why we were asking for money for a case manager and uh, a housing search worker. There are things like RAFT, as Wei Ling mentioned, uh, and there, also there's we're trying to find out creative ways to uh, get people into doubled up or tripled up situations so that they can not need shelter services. And that was basically the basis of our application. And Kevin, to clarify, as you mentioned, I'd asked, you said you'd be working with homeless individuals or those facing homelessness. 
and not necessarily. Well, primarily, that, that is our, our primary focus. But as you you had sent me an email this morning, just I think, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, just this morning, indicating what we, we will be working with families, and we are are always open to working with anyone. So it wouldn't matter to us whether there are families or homeless or or people who are uh, single individuals. Mm -hmm. We work with everyone. You still there? Yeah, yeah, no, great. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm taking notes too. Okay, yeah. Did you get my email? I did, yeah, no, thanks. To your question. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, the governor's moratorium is gonna end on, on uh, evictions at some point soon, we, we assume, and that's gonna result in more people looking for homes. The, the Salvation Army, which used to have a, a congregate shelter in Greenfield, that closed and consolidated with Wells Street in, in Greenfield. So now there's only 20 beds available there. The Northampton High School had, had uh, I believe it was 70, 70 people that they could house. That closed. And as far as I know, the cot shelter has not yet reopened. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to open until the fall. And only Grove Street is going to be open, and that has about 18 to 20. So there's already a shortage of places for people to go. And of course, we, we closed on May 3rd for the season. There's already a shortage of places to go. So this is a, this is a problem. As unemployment rises, as, as more and more evictions take place when the moratorium is lifted, this is going to create a chaotic situation that's going to result in even more people who are homeless and people who, have been, who are homeless now for the first time. Thanks, Susan. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, great. Does the committee have any questions? Gail, I think I can hear you. That looks like some people are muted. Um, I don't have any questions. Anybody else? No, I don't. Okay. And is there anybody? Well, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Is there anybody? There yeah, are there any attendees? If you'd like to speak, I, I, I didn't, no, I didn't raise ask your hand. Yeah. I don't see any hands being raised. Well, thanks again, Kevin. And um, yeah, I'm glad we were able to get your proposal. Um, sorry, I went to my spam folder before. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad to be out of your spam folder. I don't <laughs> yeah. like I don't like spam anyway. <laughs> Never Actually, I noticed that at, since you since you since that happened, I was looking through my folder and I noticed there's some other emails that went there, and it may just be maybe stricter um, COVID. I don't know why. Um, maybe just more emails. So now some are getting flagged as. Um, as yeah. Well. The the strange part for me was I was responding to you. So you were the original sender. So that's why it's funny right, to see right. that it's in your spam folder. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. And thank you to the committee. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I'll make you a, uh, an attendee. Thank you. All right, so I'm losing, where am I? Here we are. It looks like uh, PVPC. I'm not sure if anyone is um, here from PVPC. If you are, can you raise your hand? Doesn't appear to be. I don't think anyone is here from PVPC. Although they gave a clear presentation last time. All right, I'm going to show. Um, I'm going to show there. You know, the, there's a. I think the, you know, the committee members send me individual rankings, and I will say that there's, wasn't really um, an agreement. So, I think. Uh, you know, there was some. It wasn't really a, a, a clear one, two, three, or four. It seemed like there were rankings. Um, I have a pull up on a spreadsheet, but. I'll, I'll share that. It doesn't seem like uh, there was a clear um, uh, number one, number two, or number three. I think it varies. So I think, you know, for the committee, um, I'll just say that, you know, we are, the town has $400,000 that we can apply for. Um, you know, there's no um, number limiting the number of social services or, or what we're applying for. It does have to be um, to serve a majority lower moderate income uh, participants. Um, and the uh, 
for instance, PVPC is a regional application. So that budget would, you know, come from Amherst, but we would um, it'd be used by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for their, um, you know, their domestic violence program. So, you know, it wouldn't be something, it can, it would serve Amherst residents, but it would also be part of a regional application just so the committee's clear on that. You know, they're trying to pool together. I think it's over two dozen communities now to have, have this program. So, um, you know, it'd be Amherst funding that's part of a regional application. And just so for everyone to see, here's a sample of, I don't know if everyone can see that, a sample of the rankings. So I guess I was unclear on the uh, how to do the rankings or if we were going to do rankings based on these proposals that didn't fit previous criteria. Um, so I haven't submitted yeah, anything. I think um, and um, did we get notified notices as something that said we should be doing that? There's yes. an email yeah. asking, it, it's, it's to help with the conversation like we have. So, you know, we have more dollar requests of funding than we can um, support. So it was just to try to decide how, what applications to recommend to the town manager. So, you know, oh, sorry. I must have, for, in, for instance, must the committee can recommend that email too. Sorry, what, what's that? I must have missed that email too. I didn't um, understand that we were to submit rankings or. Yeah, it was, it was a recommendation. I don't think it's a requirement. It was just to help with the process. The, um, and so, I, I mean, I'm not, you know, Gail, you can have, you know, uh, see how we'd want to go. I think, like we said, there's um, a number of proposals and not enough dollars for funding. And so, you know, some members, um, you know, there's different ways we've done this in the past. So I think we just need to have a discussion about that. I mean, would the discussion begin with a straw poll to see if we want to fund all seven? Because I hear on column D, someone only submitted five and left two off. So how, how do we feel about just taking a straw poll about funding all seven, which would obviously be at, they'd all have to be somewhat reduced or some somewhat reduced. I'm not sure, but or, committee members. Or, how does it make sense to take three minutes each and summarize where we are? For those that didn't submit now? Sure, or even, even the ones that did submit, what their thought process was. Sure. Nate, what do you think? No, I think that's good. I mean, I think the committee has to make that discussion. I do think that the, um, you know, there's, um, I think that there's a little bit more funding requested than is a, than we're able to apply for. So um, I think there are some, you know, I think, um, so I think that's something the committee has to discuss. I, I guess I think starting with a discussion if we want to fund everybody partially or fund some fully and, and then some get knocked off the list. That seems to me the two equations or fund a number of them not to the maximum because we probably don't have that capacity with the dollars we have and the number of asks. <laughs> so where do we begin? Well, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we should just try to fund all seven. I think there, there's a couple places in there that um, I think don't meet the criteria. Do you want to say who those are, Paul? I think that the, uh, oh, there's, a, there's, I've got a couple of different questions, but are we going to go into that or we want to answer that first question? I'm confused. Which first question? Well, you raised the question of whether or not we should fund all seven and try to divide it or not. So I just voiced my opinion. Oh, to see if we should fund. I mean, I think we'll go down the panel and see, should we fund? I guess I'm having never gone through this before because we're always so limited because of CDBG funds. Now we have the capacity to fund, partially fund all of these or not fund a few and fully fund some. So I think that's the equation. So should we take a straw poll and talk about that and just go down? Do anybody, Andrew, Keith, you wanna weigh in? Matt? About whether this is a good place to begin? 
Sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, my view is that because there are seven, um, but there are really five issues or concerns that are being addressed. Three of them are homelessness and prevention. Uh, and I was persuaded by this very um, clear memo from John Hornick of the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, um, how important it is for them to have a partner that will uh, work with them in allocating their money um, and also in serving families and individuals to avoid homelessness. And he strongly recommends fully funding one um, experienced um, service, and I think that's the best way to go. So I would say one um, agency for each of the five different issues that uh, these proposals address. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, yeah, I agree with that for the same reason. I mean, it turns out that, you know, I think by my count, um, if we factor on uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, was it family outreach that had the, right, there's a part-time possibility or full-time? Yes. Right, so if we count, if we put in the part-time, uh, amount, then I have $464,000 uh, being requested. Um, so, yeah, I agree with what uh, Nat just said and what, with the logic of it. And um, it turns out that, so if we agree with that and we think, you know, it makes sense to fund one info, anyway, I think that actually brings us a long way <laughs> toward. You know, at least reconciling what's asked with what we have to give, if indeed we choose to fund just one of those. Yeah. So just on the on the math, if um, if we're only funding one of the homelessness um, service groups, if the family outreach is the full amount for the full time, then we're able to fully fund all of the others, including the uh, domestic abuse program at 10,700, which is in the range requested. So that all adds up to 400,000 yeah, with the, the full-time. And I'll okay. offer just one more thought or maybe two that are related. So <clears throat> yeah, so only three of us submitted um, rankings. Uh, it's true, they look like they're all over the place except for the survival center. Uh, it looks like across those three, every, they were ranked first or second across all three. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be that we're able to say, you know, presumptively, we're inclined to fund them fully. The other thing I go to is uh, Nate's point about Valley CDC. You know, they asked for 203, you know, he said and they said, certainly there's a, a larger, you know, we could go to 250, there's greater need. You know, that's a significant chunk given how much we have to allocate. That might be a decision we want to make as well, fairly, fairly upfront in this process. Okay. Uh, Keith, thank you, Andrew. Keith? I think we should fully fund the ones that we choose. Um, and I think those that are uh, social service focused should be the ones that we choose to fund. Um, partial funding, um, our experiences showed us causes, you know, certain issues and hardships for even those that receive dollars. And I think just to make this as easy as possible for everyone involved, we recognize um, direct assistance is what individuals and households need right now with the basic necessities of life. The programs that target those outcomes should receive full funding uh, based on their current request. So did you, um, of the three that ha were submitted, were you, you, you did not submit um, your rankings? I did. You did, oh, okay. Okay. I mean, I don't think, I was gonna say, I don't think back? you have to say which committee members submitted rankings. It was just, you know, like we've done, it's kind of a, a, a basis for discussion. I think, you know, 
is there a trend that's seen? I think uh, Andrew pointed out that, or Melissa pointed out that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that my um, better half, my better half for sure. That the food pantry was is a uh, highly ranked, and so I, I mean, I think you know what the committee's done before. I think if 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 that's in a, a consensus and we're saying full funding, then you know that's 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 one. That's a starting point, and we can you know go from there. Can you, um, um, Nate? Can you just go back to that the Excel sheet instead of this? Um, just for one quick second oh, sure, so yeah. you can oh, see it, please. Yeah. Let me, um, so can people see the Excel spreadsheet now? Yes, thank you. Okay. I just want to give a plug for the literacy project because as I was thinking of the asks that are being made, yes, people need to eat and people need to have a place to live, but enabling them, <laughs> enabling folks to go out and earn income and be, um, take care of themselves feels really important to me. And I don't think that the literacy project's budget is bloated. I think $20,000 is not a lot of money and you're helping people become self-sustaining um, going forward. And I think in this economy where everything feels so difficult, I am an advocate for funding the literacy project because I think we need to get people trained and in jobs um, as quickly as we can given what's going on. And I'm not saying that handouts are wrong, that's not what I'm saying at all, but I think giving people a chance to be educated and secure a weekly paycheck will keep them away from these other services. So I'm a big fan of the literacy project. Anybody want to weigh in on that? I agree. I think that's, that's one of the five areas that uh, we should fully fund. Okay. So are we, okay. So as we go forward, I'm taking notes. So we've kind of agreed that Amherst Survival Center feels like because it showed up in the top rankings that it should be fully funded and literacy project is another um, social service agency that should be fully funded. Are we going that route? And then we can, is, is this a good way to go and then kind of talk about the others? Oh, you're um, muted. Again, I, I didn't quite. Oh. Sorry, um, oh, you're, you're muted again. Um, that, that we're kind of working down the lists and because of the rankings that have appeared in the discussions, we feel that Amherst Survival Center should be fully funded. And I got the feeling from my statement that Literacy Project be another organization that's fully funded and we could keep going down the list. I am going to buck the trend. I disagree with Keith and I think even partially funding these organ some of these other organizations is better than no funding at all. I mean, the need is super great. And if everybody could benefit somewhat from this $400,000, they can wake up tomorrow morning, well, after the recommendations are made to the town manager, but they can it, it de-stresses the employees of the organization, these, these nonprofits, and helps unburden them from the need to fundraise so stringently considering what we've got going on. So I'm an advocate, having worked at a nonprofit, written grants, that a partial funding feels less a smack in the face than um, no funding at all. So I would like to see everybody partially funded or you know, not everybody. I would like to see everybody, all of these applicants receive some funds even if not to the all to the full amount, which I know obviously we can't. We, um, you know, I will say that DHD has said they'd like to see, you know, um, proposals that necessarily aren't, you know, that are addressing a unique need. So right now we do have some that are somewhat um, overlapping. And so, you know, my thought is, um, um, for instance, the Family Outreach and Amherst Community Connections and Craig's Doors are doing something similar maybe with a different population or some, you know, um, maybe some slight differences, but they're, they're similar in terms of uh, case management and housing support. Um, so I think we, I would just want the committee to, if, if you're recommending two, if you're recommending those three or two or the three, you know, to explain uh, the difference. Because I think what we have to do with DHCD is really say how those are are different because I, I could see DHCD saying now that they would like to, you know, could the, com the town combine that into one? Um, they're really hoping to stretch dollars and see, you know, different areas of need and impact. And so I do think that they are, um, and it could be addressing slightly different populations, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're very similar. So, um, can, can we, 
Nate, can we put that in a park, the parking lot for a minute and sure. then use, go to that, those three last and talk about town of Amherst and Valley CDC because that's sure. another big chunk of money. Sure. And um, so if we agree to fully fund survival center and um, literacy project, that's 120. So that leaves us 280. And so we can kind of pair our way, work our way down with um, considering town of Amherst and Valley CDC as a gigantic ask. The, um, just a quick, like, Ted Parker has raised his hand a few times. If, I, <clears throat> if you want me to recognize him to speak, Gail? Sure, in the three to five minute rule. Okay, all right, Ted, I'm going to allow you to speak now. You have to unmute yourself. Yep. Thank you. I lowered my hand uh, after I, I decided that I, I didn't want to speak so, but thank you for recognizing me. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. <laughs> Let me uh, lower your hand then. I think that's, we're good. Yeah. So just a, so a, a couple thoughts. One is I think we should, um, yeah, I think survival, I, I don't think we should yet put literacy project in a to be funded. Um, Gail, I think you've made a, a strong argument for that. And as I look at the rankings, I see that one of them has its, has literacy project last and one of them doesn't have it at all. So at least we should yeah, sort of canvas the committee um, and see if in fact you've been persuasive or people agree or you know whatever, whatever we put it. I mean, I think they put it differently just judging from what we see, they're in a somewhat different category than the survival center, right? Which shows very, very strongly across the three that were submitted. I do um, agree that, you know, I think it makes sense to think about Valley CDC <clears throat> and mostly, and this is in keeping with what Nate said, I actually want to endorse again Nat's recommendation about these five categories. Um, we may not want to fund all five categories, but again, you know, Nate points out that, you know, the funder has emphasized, uh, you know, non-duplicative uh, funding. Um, so the idea of, you know, thinking about in terms of these five categories of needs that people are proposing to meet, I think makes a lot of sense. Okay, I hear you. Do you want to, do we want to jump to um, Amherst, um, town of Amherst and Valley CDC because they are the biggest, they're making the largest request. Anybody, okay. anybody want to comment? I, I really want to support what they're doing. I think that, um, you know, these are kind of micro business loans and they are really for, you know, low income, small operations that really kind of fall through a lot of the other support programs that are out there. And, you know, I, you know, there, there may be well more than $203,000 of need out there. And so I don't know, you know, what the right number is, but I think, you know, because this state, pro, you know, federal state program, is really focused on kind of these two areas, kind of the microenterprise assistance as well as the social services. Um, you know, roughly half the money going to microenterprise, um, you know, low income, small business owners who are struggling to survive. I think that balance roughly half the total you know, makes sense to me. Uh, so I, I think that's, you know, a good, Good number. Full, to fully fund them at the 203,000 level. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment? Keith? I do. Oh. Uh, Keith or me? You go ahead, Paul. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's an, a lot of money. And I think that that is going to be the uh, really a great use of this money because the, the need for these businesses, I mean, <laughs> We're going to be struggling for a while trying to get our businesses, our economy back up in the Amherst. And uh, I think that that's, you know, a targeted group that uh, certainly could use at least that much money. So I, I'd su really support it too. Anybody else want to comment? 
No, only the, on, the only thing is uh, the obvious point, really, that if we fundament 203 and Survival Center fully, let's say, which you know seems plausible given how highly they're ranked, that's obviously 303, which leaves 97 across you know all these other areas. Um, so I guess the only thing I would say is probably is that we we shouldn't fund them at more than that uh, if we want to try to support some of these other groups. I agree. Any, anybody I think, else? I think we can still fully fund you know, five of the um, five of these areas. Um, I I just don't have a good feeling of what the impact of the uh, town and CDC funds would be. And if using Northampton as an example, where the average funding was less than $6,000, that's not going to save a small business. Um, that's a real hole in the presentation. Um, and we have other funding um, resources available uh, through the Chamber of Commerce and the BID and the Amherst Downtown Foundation where these small business <laughs> owners can directly apply for an amount of money that they determine based on what their needs are. Um, I don't know. I, I think immediacy of impact uh, matters with these dollars and that um, proposal just doesn't get me there because of the amount that each individual business would actually be getting. Because of the ambiguity of number of businesses, amount each business would get and immediacy of impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I, I hadn't thought, um, thought of that, but that's a very good point. Um, I think their statistics are, were, you know, what they've been doing is related to um, uh, small businesses that are trying to get off the ground and they were adding, uh, they were trying to help them with whatever. And that's where that money went for, it wasn't in this uh, environment. So, I, you, you know, I, I agree that I'm not sure what that amount of money is going to do. Um, as you said, you know, it's a drop in the bucket, I guess. Anybody else want to comment on Town of the Emerson Valley CDC? Well, I mean, only that. Um, I think, yeah, for me, that I zero in on, I think, part of what Keith was saying, which is, or to, I guess maybe to frame it a slightly different way, um, we know, even under good circumstances, we know that a lot of small businesses fail. Right, and these obviously are not good circumstances. So even apart from how much money, you know, I do find myself, right, so if you give someone meals or if you, you know, help them, maybe it's really clear that at least for a time, you're staving off disaster, right? The, the, the benefit is very clear. You have success if you feed people, if you home them, you know, house them, et cetera. Um, here, <clears throat> arguably you have success if you, keep a business afloat for a time, but if the business goes down, you know, in two months, so it's very hard to assess, right? We're often in this position. It's very hard to assess the value of providing that service when the service you provide in this case doesn't necessarily mean that the business succeeds in the end. I just don't know how to assess that, the value of doing this thing over here versus that thing. And, and I should say, and you know, I'm, I know that we all feel this way and I suspect we always feel this way. Um, and it's just very hard to <laughs> talk about, like these proposals I thought were, were really very strong. It's odd even to see the rankings here, you know, as if folks that are ranked at the end weren't strong, they were strong. It's in fact, it's a reflection of how strong they were in my view. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that the um, uh, for the micro business, it is a priority for the state. And so I agree, it, 
you know, even with housing, even though there's a housing moratorium, we don't know if, for instance, the town's doing a rental program, you know, if that will um, keep people housed, you know, in the long term. So we're asking landlords to work with the town. With the businesses, um, for this funding, they have to show a loss of business equal to the amount of money they're requesting. So DHCD is trying to have, uh, you know, show, you know, have them show that there is a, an impact because of COVID and that they need funding. Um, you know, I think that most of these, you know, are less than five employees. And I think that Nat was right that they, you know, they weren't the business that received some of the foundation funding from the town and they're the type of business that doesn't have the capacity sometimes to apply for the SBA or other programs, you know, um, it takes a lot of effort and paperwork. So there, you know, I think DHCD heard from a number of communities that the microenterprises were the ones that kind of missed out on some of the other programs just because of the ability to act fast and, um, you know, actually then have the, you know, the numbers and the capacity to put some of the, you know, fill out all the paperwork. Um, you know, I think even some of the other help that other businesses receive, don't know if you'll, you know, if they'll make it long term. And just a point of clarity, we're probably offering these as um, essentially grants, not loans to the businesses. So, you know, DHC is allowing them to be grants of up to $10,000. So we're not necessarily asking for a repayment. Um, we're just asking for some certifications on how it's spent, but we're not asking for a repayment. I mean, I have to say out of the, the three lists of priorities submitted, Valley CDC came in in the top three in column B and C. It did come in as number five in column D. So people did rank it in the, two, two of us ranked it in the higher, in the top three. Just throwing that out there. Okay, <laughs> not making much progress, but interesting discussion. Um, so we're, we've lumped together the um, Family Outreach, uh, Craig's Doors, and Amherst Community Connections, and because they do similar work. And then we've talked about Town of Amherst, we've talked about Survival Center. So how about if we talk about the PVPC Regional Application um, for Domestic Violence Victim Safety Enhancement? And that's an, an, an up to $10,000. So how does it work Nate, with the amount when they say up to? I think, you know, I think they were, um, you know, like they were trying to fund a position or a position. So, you know, they're saying if they had so many communities and each community provided enough and that could fund, you know, whether it's like, you know, one and a half position. So, you know, the 10 to $12,000 a range, I think if, if it needs to be a little less, I think they would accept it. You know, they, they were seem pretty uh, flexible. You're talking yeah, about but, but just, but just to be clear, uh, the range that they're asking for is 10 to 12,000, right? Yes. Okay. Right. And their, you know, their proposal last time discussed, you know, having working with the behavioral health network and having, you know, clinicians on call for, you know, a number of communities that then people could call in and then they would, um, you know, it's actually for the perpetrator so that they could try to DS, you know, these um, people on the phone could try to deescalate the situation. So it's something that they're trying to work on as a regional application. Seems like a relatively small amount, but um, it could have a huge impact for people who can be helped. And it's great that, um, that we're part of a regional program. We can pool resources with other communities in the area. So. I thought it was a pretty strong proposal. How do people feel about fully funding PVPC, the regional application for 10 to fully um, fund? I would fully support that. I think this is a hugely important issue uh, that's, that we know has been, it's a, it's a problem that obviously pre-existed COVID, but has been greatly exacerbated by it. Um, yeah, that's a very modest amount of money um, yeah, I would, I would absolutely fully support it. Anybody else want to weigh in? Well, yeah. Um, the the uh, idea behind this uh, hotline for basically uh, perpetrators is um, I, I would totally support it, but I don't think that we're going to see much of an impact in relation to the uh, COVID sort of issues and it'll be a long time 
before we see any impact from it if even we're able to get they're able to get anybody to even call this hotline because perpetrators tend not to be particularly uh, cooperative and if people aren't meeting with people and talking with people or in doing things that might encourage this. I'm not, I think it's a great idea, but I think it needs uh, a lot of work and it's a long-term uh, issue. I have to disagree with Paul because um, I'm no expert, but I've been hearing so much in the media about, you know, during this COVID quarantine um, era that there are so many people at risk because of close quarters and the quarantine uh, at risk of domestic violence. And so I think, I think this is definitely uh, relevant, um, immediate. What effect it will have, I'm no expert, I can't help it. I think you know, putting a small amount of money uh, to invest in that type of program, um, I think makes a lot of sense. I agree with you, um, Nat. And in the proposal overview, it says, um, it will reduce, this project will reduce harm to domestic violence victims by helping perpetrators make safer choices and by supporting victims connected to perpetrators served by this project. So I think that this is a, I mean, if you're saving a life for $10,000, it's a, it's definitely a, a good investment. Anybody else? Um, Keith, yeah. you want to weigh in on this? Uh, I'm supportive of, as well, fully funding. Okay. Can I say another thing? Sure. So this isn't gonna protect anybody. It's going to work with perpetrators. And if there's, doesn't indicate any funding to work with victims, although there's that little comment you made, but um, I've worked with domestic violence for the last 40 years. Um, and <clears throat> by funding a hotline for the perpetrator isn't, going to provide safety in the short run. That's all, you know, I just wanted to say that again. It's not going to provide safety in the short run. That's what you're saying. Right. But the proposal comp component says a free confidential helpline will provide support to anyone at risk of being violent within the grant region. So it's just not serving perpetrators according to the writing, grant proposal. No, that's what it says. The grant is uh, to, per to create a hotline for perpetrators specifically. So a victim wouldn't be calling that hotline. It says I right here. They, I think they could. I, um, I, mean, I think it's a difficult Paul, to assess sometimes, you know, in terms of the harm reduction, I do think, you know, there's, you know, other hotlines, you know, like a suicide hotline. I think the idea would be if, if this program is up and running, it can be advertised to other uh, social service agencies and others. So it becomes something that, you know, is, it is an available resource. Um, so if someone needs, needs help, they could call, you know, whether or not they're going to make that call. That's, you know, I, I, I can't say the, you know, the percentage, but at least it becomes um, something that's available that isn't there now. Um, you know, I, the statistics are hard to say. I thought PVPC did a good job explaining that they have the ability to get it up and running and broadcast it widely to, so that people will know it's there. Yeah, what kind of help do you think somebody would get when they call? I think there could be some, you know, some de-escalation, some just allowing someone to um, talk through what they're thinking. I mean, you know, it's, I, you know, I agree, is it going to, you know, is it going to create like a, um, in terms of protection, you know, it's not, you know, it's not like a physical barrier all, you know, all of a sudden in the space they're in, but it's some communication. If a person, if a victim is living with a perpetrator, she's not, they're not able to make a phone call to a line, to a hotline like this. If they get out of the house or sit in the car, they can. <clears throat> I don't want to get into the weeds with yeah, this, yeah. See, this, um, this and, it, and it feels it, like we're going down that hole. That's the problem. It doesn't Pardon? make any sense that this would actually do anything. Well, have you looked at the proposal? I've done it carefully, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, can I just say this? So I think there, uh, yeah, as a non-expert too, as most of us are, I think, I, I think there's, to me, it's clear that there is a, a, pos a possible mechanism where this could work. Whether it will work or not, right? Or, or how, you know, I think none of us except possibly you, Paul, have probably had, I certainly don't, and Nat said he didn't have the expertise to assess as an expert whether or not, right, this, it actually makes sense. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, I mean, people have um, assembled coalitions that do things that don't work. So the fact that there's a coalition of people trying to do this doesn't mean that it's going to work. But I'm, again, I think it's a very small amount of money. It's addressing an issue that we all agree is very important. It's addressing it in a somewhat, uh, at least, innovative way. Um, and I am supportive of granting them uh, the money to join the coalition to see if it works. The fact that there is a coalition of people who presumably do have expertise and think it's worth trying persuades me that it's at least worth trying. And then if it doesn't work, then if someone comes back to us again and asks for more money to do the same thing that didn't work the first time, perhaps we say no. But the truth is, yeah, we're not in the position to argue, mm -hmm. I don't think. The no, I think what's being presented is I, I agree with everything you said. I just don't think that um, what they're trying to get started is something that I believe doesn't exist anywhere. And it is a great idea. It's something that can be useful. Uh, but I don't think this is the model to fund it with. I would like to see it funded, but not, I don't see how this is going to, you know, actually accomplish it. Okay. Uh, so, Nate, you want to give us some direction? Well, I, uh, what I've heard is the, um, you know, it's like, I mean, I, I think people have reiterated Nat's point that there's, you know, some different areas that are being um, addressed with the proposals. I think we could, we could walk down the list. Um, before that, Gail, I don't, I don't know if you just want to ask if there's any public comment. The committee's I saw Kevin before. Noonan had raised his hand. Yeah, and then it went away. Kevin, if, if anyone wants to raise their hand, we could. It's like Ted Parker has his hand raised. I'll, Ted, I'll allow you to speak here. You should be all set. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to point out that unlike the normal round of CDBG funding, this, is, this money is not guaranteed, right? This is an application for this money. And if I'm not mistaken, the town of Amherst is in competition even with non-entitlement communities for this money. Is that right, Nate? Right, so DHCD has 9.65 million that they will be awarding to up to, you know, 300, we're considered, say, non-entitlement, 300 non-entitlement communities or however many applications there are. Right, so there's a lot of communities who aren't normally eligible for CDBG funding who may very well be applying for this money and in competition with Amherst for this money. So the $400,000 is far from guaranteed. They might decide other communities are more worthy or they might decide that Amherst should only be funded for some portion of this money. And so in that competition, it seems to me the application by Amherst should be tightly focused on the criteria uh, that we use to uh, appropriate the money in the first place, which is COVID response and organizations that have proven capacity, et cetera. This, I think, was even described in its application as a pilot program. And I, I think that normal CDBG funding round might be appropriate for this kind of program, but I worry that in looking at piles of applications from municipalities for, for this round, that municipalities that don't have a tightly focused application may be set to the side while towns, large and small, who have tightly focused applications on very specific COVID related issues may be fully funded first. Just like you guys have ranked things in an order of priority, so too may those who are making the decision about this money. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll just say, uh, yeah, Ted reminded me there was a conference call the other other week with DHCD and a program like this was brought up, um, you know, and DHCD asked for more information. So they didn't, they didn't say it was ineligible, but, you know, again, they, you know, they would ask, how does it address COVID and what are the impacts? The, um, and so I think, you know, I thought the uh, proposal by PVPC was, was very explanatory. The question is, would DHCD, if we're asking how, what are the impacts, would DHCD ask the same um, and say, okay, is there um, a way to address, is there going to be an immediate um, addressal of impacts by this? So I just, you know, to make that um, apparent. It looks like there's a few other hands raised, Gail. Should we? Sure. I'm gonna go, go ahead and call on them. Joanne. Joanne, I think it's you. Joanne, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. So I just want to oh. let um, the committee know and others on the phone sort of what the what our neighbors are doing. Um, and as Nate said. Um, you know, there is a priority for the micro businesses. And so uh, the city of Greenfield is going in with a um, regional application for all of Franklin County. They're putting in a proposal because each community can apply for $400,000. Of course, there's nowhere near enough money for every community to do that. But uh, Greenfield and its region are going in for $500,000 for this uh, micro grant program up to $10,000 per business and they are uh, not doing any social services and I'm not saying anything about social service I'm just giving you information um, uh, who, who we are in competition. Uh, Hilltown CDC which is also putting in a regional application um, and they are putting in for at least $500,000 with uh, probably about $75,000 of uh, request uh, for supplemental food for the Hilltowns. Um, and then I was on a uh, call yesterday with the uh, City of East Hamptons public meeting, and they're going, they're the lead agency for a regional application that includes Hadley, Hatfield, South Hadley, West Hampton, South Hampton, I'm probably missing somebody. They're potentially going in somewhere between 1.2 and $1.5 million, all for micro business. So, I don't know as much as Nate about where DHCD is looking um, since we all have to be competitive, but this is where a, a lot of CDBG and the communities are looking at the small business model. So I'm just letting you know what my, our immediate neighbors are, are uh, planning to apply for. Yeah, I think, Thanks, Joanne. I think you know, DHCD, you know, they had the two um, categories, microenterprise assistance and then social services, and they uh, listed, you know, it was, it was uh, food security, housing, and job training, and then they said other others uh, that may need to be explained. And, um, you know, I will say that DHCD put out a survey to communities asking what they think priorities would be, I think, for this round and possibly a second round of funding. And so I think, um, you know, I, I would say that it is, you know, microenterprise and social services now. So for instance, microenterprise is less than five. And people have been saying, well, what about businesses that are less than 10, which is just considered a small business. So I think, you know, DHCD is anticipating that if there's a future round of funding, there may be other categories that become priorities. But for now, you know, they listed microenterprise assistance and then those few social services and possibly other social services. They didn't, they, they didn't try to create an exhaustive list of social services, but I think you know, those two generally, social services and microenterprise are priorities now. It looks like Laura from Family Outreach would like to speak. Uh, Laura, I'm going to allow you to speak. I think I did. A lot of talk, maybe I hit some, the wrong button. <laughs> I think I, hold on a minute, Laura, you, you keep moving around on my screen. Oh. I think I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Alan, Frank, somehow I, I hit you. I'm sorry. Let me. Um... All right, Laura, I, I think you're available. Okay. Hi. I just wanted to comment that in my proposal, I did um, just give a list of the different services we do serve. And we do uh, provide um, services for domestic violence and, and have been um, 
we always do, and we certainly have been responding to um, families and women um, over these past few months. We have been helping people with uh, emergency um, uh, protective orders and um, orders, renewal, renew orders, and helping women uh, uh, fill out paperwork that they need to do to keep everything in order. So it is something that Family Outreach does and we will absolutely continue to do. So I know, I understand what Paul's uh, problem is. I mean, um, it is, it's a little bit, it's not direct service. It's not boots on the ground as, as much as I think some people feel comfortable with. Although over time, certainly uh, getting perpetrators help is, is important. So I'm not trying to um, say that, but in terms of uh, absolute direct service of, of helping somebody is in, in a situation, that's one of the things Family Outreach does all the time. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So does that help everyone? <laughs> the, um, oh, thanks, I know this is a difficult decision. So just a reminder, uh, the committee's making recommendations to the town manager and the town needs to apply um, you know, by next Friday. And Ted Parker was right that it is a competitive application. There's no, you know, as a mini entitlement, we're not um, applying through that mini entitlement status. It's uh, as a, you know, a COVID um, proposal. The, um, you know, I think the agencies who have submitted, I think, you know, asking them to submit brief proposals and budgets will really help the town. So, you know, with the committee's recommendations, I think that the town has, um, you know, we have a, a good start on, on the application of DHCD. So with that, Gail, do you just want maybe want to run down the, 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 I'm not sure, what are we seeing here? Let me make sure we see the, um, I'm just going to share that table again and maybe we go down the list of proposals. Sure. So is, I just want to reiterate what we discussed previously, that the mm -hmm. thinking is that between Family Outreach, Craig's Doors, and Amherst Community Connections, we would select one amongst the three to, to fund? Is that what we're thinking about, uh, CDBG members? Well, it's certainly a possibility. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously a possibility that's been promoted. And um, I think we should, so here's just a process suggestion. You know, if we talk about that, just air whatever's on our mind about that, um, and then submit rankings, Again, all of us. I wonder if that not, might not be a good way to at least get a sense of the committee, right? When it comes to actually making choices about whom to support and perhaps even the amount, because that was one of the things that was helpful about doing it before, right? It gave us a starting point, mm -hmm. especially if there was some amount of consensus around, you know, ones that we thought were very strong and ones that we thought, right, and that we could focus on the middle. But if we have the, if we do it in reverse order, we have the conversation then submit, right, and sort of we can get a quicker sense of the committee, assuming that there's some degree of consensus. It's just a possibility. That sounds reasonable. Anybody want to challenge Andrew or? That sounds like a good idea. Okay, and I see Kevin Noonan has his hand raised, Not Sure. Kevin, I'm Nate. allowing you to speak. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, you just have time. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. You know, we're all three of the agencies that are focused on services to people who are homeless do great work. And, the, and to tell us that you know, we're a very small agency, some agencies are bigger, but to tell us that with no money is, is preferable to some money isn't really helpful. We, we do our best with what we have. And CDBG funding, this is a similar thing that we applied for in 2018, which my predecessor applied for. And you know, at that point, CDBG has that built in name. No more than five agencies can do uh, social services. You know what I mean? So we're free of that in this, in this round. So I would recommend that when, when it comes to the services for people who are homeless, who, which is a priority in this round of funding, that, uh, that we just divide up to whatever's left, whatever you decide is left, divide it equally among the three agencies. 
if that's possible. Uh, just because a little helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Two other participants have raised their hand. Kevin's sort of echoing what so, I said. So can can I ask um, for the committee, what is the process here? Are we going to continue to have everyone raise their hand and not be able to discuss until all the hands are down? Or is there a time limit? Or how is this going to work? I think it's... Um, the, uh, it's 4.35 right now, so I don't, you know, it's, I think it's up to the committee. We can, um, <clears throat> uh, we want to recognize Wei Ling, Gail. Uh, she, you know, yes, she was yes, and I think that we should cut off public comment and do our work. All right. Hey, Wei Ling, you're um, unmuted now, or allowed to speak. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. And uh, do I need to unmute my screen or you can see me? I, we can hear you if that's, if that's sufficient. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And um, it has always been our philosophy. We want to attach housing, support, housing to the support service in order to make the support service more tangible. And we have been very you know, good at getting people into permanent housing if they have support service along with the somewhat unstable housing they are struggling with, but the goal is to get them into permanent housing. So I want to say that we have applied to be one of the four bidders for the um, emergency rental uh, assistance program. And our idea when I apply for this particular CDBG CARES, my thinking was that if we can put the housing that we are trying to preserve through the other part of the money as one of the bidders, we will be able to help people provide to preserve their housing if we can provide in tandem of the support service from you, if you can give us money. Otherwise, if we don't have the support service and we happen to be one of the bidders chosen to provide the be, to be administrator to administer to administer the uh, the rental assistance, then it really make the effectiveness of the program less tangible, and that means we will have to do you know referral to other agencies. So I am really hoping that we can have a full package of housing preservation plus support service to achieve the long-term housing stability and economic self-sufficiency. So I want to echo what Kevin said, a little bit of something for all of us who are in it together, it means a lot. So given this is one of the times you don't have a maximum five agency that you can only fund. So if you have the freedom to fund as many agencies as possible, for us, it's really a very you know wonderful confirmation affirmation for the work we all do and do it so diligently so i know that you you are struggling as who to fund but look at we are together our agency craig stores family outreach of amherst we have a network of support for the people who are struggling so i want to say please give us some affirmation of the work we do by giving us even a little bit of funding. Otherwise, I would feel walking away feeling, well, if I get a whole thing, I don't feel good. If I get nothing, I really feel terrible. Feel my work, our work here is not being validated. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just want to ask the committee, while you've been listening to people's comments and mulling over the proposals in front of us, has anybody been doing any back of the envelope calculations to kind of see what the potential of what this could possibly look like. I mean, I know I have, and just wondering yes. if anybody else has. Yes. You have. So Definitely. can can I ask Nat to throw out what you've um, come oh, up with? Right. So if we if we fully fund the micro enterprise, uh, fully fund the survival center, uh, fully fund literacy project, and have. 10,000 for the domestic abuse uh, program, then 
we are able to fully fund a full-time caseworker at Family Outreach and have $700 to spare, which we could you know, increase survival center or a grant enterprise or, but basically we can fully fund, you know, five of these areas of need. Gail, can we hear your thought? You also well, I, have your calculations? I, my calculation is um, fully fund the survival center. Um, I'm just looking at the, the sheet. I have it in two places for 100,000, fully fund the literacy project at, one, at 20. So that brings us to 120. And then town of Amherst fund at 175. That brings us to 295. And then that leaves us 110 left. And then I thought we could take um, Family Outreach, Craig Stores, and Amherst Community Connections and find a percentage of what they've asked and divide that among the 110. Because I feel like funding, everybody needs a little bit to make them move forward. I, I'm not a big fan of not, of not funding anybody and um, except maybe the domestic violence victim safety enhancement, which I'm feeling more on the fence about. And, and not funding the town fully at the 203 level, but at 175, which free up 28 to go towards family outreach, Craig stores and Amherst Community Connections. <laughs> Comments? Questions? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, that, uh, the first um, sort of uh, comments about funding um, comes up, I think makes some sense. I think that Craig's door is reaching for some money to do something they've never really done before. It's a new aspect and, and uh, so I'm not sure their delivery on that and if, what kind of staffing they have. Um, the family outreach, of, not family outreach, I mean the uh, uh, community connections is um, that their proposals inaccurate. The budget is a uh, deficit of $44,000. Um, so if we give them less than what they've asked, it's going to be even more. <clears throat> and if we give them the full amount, it's still $44,000 in deficit. Um, and it's not, it's just replacing money that they thought they were getting. It's not doing anything for the current uh, priorities. So, and that would leave everybody else other than the, uh, uh, the literacy, which is the one with the, uh, the, the domestic violence one. So if we, if we didn't fund those three, then everybody else could be funded fully. And uh, if, you, if you didn't fund which three? Um, the PBPC regional application, <coughs> Craig's Doors, and Amherst Community Connections. So then there would be an family outreach of Amherst has the component to pick those things up. And I think that they've got the most experience with delivery in, in that kind of a, uh, in the situation. They, and they cover a real wide variety um, of services for people. So that's my thoughts. So along those lines, just really sort of picking up on that, I, I'm trying to look at the, um, you know, if, if there are, if given the conversation, given what I think I'm hearing, if we are circling in on some consensus strengths, right? And I feel like a consensus proposal that we want to solve. So I think from the very beginning, I'm risk survival center. And my guess is that we are happy to fund that fully at 100K. Obviously, we can talk about that if not. Um, it, there's um, a yeah, real question. We do have some question about Valley CDC. Um, so I have, I'm personally inclined certainly to fund it, but 
would be inclined for money reasons and in light of some of the doubts to support it a bit less than what they've asked for. So along the lines that Gail, you suggested, but by and large, I'm hearing that we do want to fund that. So that would be in there. And now um, I'm agreed with, with Paul on family outreach. Um, that seemed strong. I have, you know, a lot of confidence in what they can do. And I would be inclined to fund the full-time uh, position. Um, you know, so that's 65, nine. If we add those three up, and Paul, I think I'm probably just echoing you really. Um, so I think I'm just endorsing what you said, but you know, 100 plus, let's say 170, sorry? No, I'm sorry, my husband's talking to me. <laughs> oh, okay, that <laughs> hubby. Oh. So anyway, 100 plus 175, let's say obviously that can shift, plus 66, essentially 65, nine. That mm -hmm. gets us up to 341. Um, you know, with 59 to go. And then, so it's three. And, and then, then I think we are supposing, I mean, this may be an obvious point, but I think we are supposing that, anyway, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it there. But what would you recommend for the remaining 59? Well, um, you know, this is where <laughs> I think we were probably still fragmented. I mean, I, I continue to, you know, I would support um, the PBC, PVPC regional at the 10. Um, and, you know, the, I, I don't know, we can talk about Amherst Community Connection and Craig's Doors, and I, I don't have a strong take on that. But tell me if this might be helpful or not. You know, uh, if Nate, if you're able to put up, so we've had you know, essentially three, two or three different proposals in a way for allocation, right? I wonder if we could see those side by side, right? So in all of them, Survival Center gets funded probably fully. In all of them, CDC gets funded large, you know, from 175 to 203 or something like that. Um, if what I've said makes sense, if we agree on family outreach, you know, certainly being funded and, and maybe even being funded at the full, you know, for a full-time person. Um, and then, you know, then it's about, you know, we could do some different allocations, right? So Nat had one, Gail, you had a different one. We could actually have something concrete to look at, so, and, and, but we're talking about $59,000 or so. And what if we funded a literacy project for 10 oh, okay. instead of 20? I mean, they initially asked for 10. And then they increased it to 20. But I like, Andrew, I really like your proposal. I, yes, I think it would be helpful to see the numbers. Maybe you can plug them in on the, on the Excel sheet. Nate? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing that right now. Great. Um. Okay, guys, here's a fourth option. Let's fully fund all the social services except PV, um, PC, and let's only give uh, whatever is remaining to uh, CDC. Sorry, Keith, say, Keith. say that again, Keith. Fully fund all the social services okay. except PVPC. Uh huh. And whatever is remaining goes to okay. CDC. Yeah. Simple. And? Yeah, that's it. So that would, you know cut down significantly on CDC, but they've got something. On all the social service. So 65 million, 47. I'm just doing the math. All right, how does that sound? Keith's proposal. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't think that we should be spreading the money around just to, you know, make people feel better. Um, you know, there, there were, you know, those la those three that we're thinking about not funding. Um, there are good arguments why they're not uh, going to be the most effective use of the dollars and. I think the town of Amherst, the Valley CDC, that's <clears throat> probably 
a big deal as far as the state's concerned. And I think that <clears throat> money going to these businesses, um, you know, it's a grant, it's not a loan. So that's helpful. <clears throat> um, and it, it just it makes sense to me to fund them and, and looking at each proposal with a yes or a no, or maybe, um, but rather than just, uh, you know, sort of blanket, you know, to everybody gets a little bit means that everybody doesn't do quite as much as they could and maybe yes, fail um, in some ways. So uh, that's my thought. I think the, um, yeah, here's just a quick, um, table um if can everyone see that should i make it a little bigger it's good the um yeah i mean i might i'm a little you know it's interesting um you know in terms of what i'm thinking the state would look for you know my thought would be if um if we fund um you know uh family outreach craig's doors and amherst community connections i think we'd have to make the case that that's an efficient way to to um, disperse funds as opposed to funding a one full-time position. I just want to make sure that, you know, the state doesn't see it as being redundant. And so, you know, I'd want to make sure that we can explain that it's addressing COVID related impacts and that it is, you know, um, you know, that, it, that it's, a, it's a good use, um, you know, um, for Amherst. The quickly, so this is um, uh, Nat's, um, Idea. Sorry for the abbreviations, everyone. There's, you know, Valley Community Development, uh, the the Food Pantry Literacy Project, PVPC, and then uh, Family Outreach, and that gets to you know 400,000. The um, Gail, this was your idea. Um, um, food Pantry Literacy Project, Valley CDC, and then split. Yeah, I said Valley CDC at like 175. Oh yeah, 170. 170, 175. That, yeah, that, so that gets us to about the, the uh, application amount. And then the also, other one. Also, also just um, one correction of family outreach, FOA, their request is for 65.9 or make it 66 for full time. Oh, uh, yeah. My, some typos there. The, um, and then, you know, Paul had mentioned, you know, funding, um, these, you know, these organizations, Valley CDC, the Food Pantry Literacy Project and Family Outreach and not funding three. And so that's- And then, that's, and then Keith was suggesting funding them all and the remainder to Valley CDC, which would be a hundred K. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, my fingers couldn't type as fast as <laughs> Keith was. Um, his, his statement was so simple, but it took a lot of work. <laughs> but I think it amounts to, by my calculator, a hundred thousand one hundred dollars would be left over for Valley CDC and the rest to get funded as they've asked. Uh, it's some money associated with it. The um, <coughs> if that's if we funded everyone fully, I mean, so it's yeah. And and Nate, and that wouldn't if we fully funded the family outreach. Craig's Stores and Amherst Community Connections, would that reduce our chances of being funded through the state because of the redundancy issue? Or are we better off just funneling the money just to one of those three to increase our chances? I think if funds? we apply that way, we'd have to make the case that, you know, it's not, it's funding that's necessary to address COVID impacts. It's not, you know, to fill budget holes or it's not reaching for, um, you know, it's not, um, um, you know, something that, something that the agency could do and that they're targeting somewhat different populations and, you know, um, but DHCD could say that it seems like it's, they're all, it's, it's going to the same thing, right? It's kind of the same category right. uh, under housing or housing support. Um, you know, I'm not sure how they would view that. So I was just running, trying to run some quick numbers on the key scenario. Well, the way you just stated it to pledge budget holes, that's exactly what Amherst Community Connections is looking for, right? Because you didn't get the two, those the well, two. The yeah, two. but also that there is a need. I mean, so they clearly right. said that there's there you know there's a, a much greater need for referrals and for housing work and assistance. So, I think 
you know, I think all the proposals are addressing a, a COVID need. It's a, you know, some of it is how are some addressing it. Um, and and if we and if the funding was lost because of COVID impacting another funder, then there's a COVID impact. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I do think that yeah. So Andrew is right. So if we f fully fund, let me do a new share. Um, let me show this table. If we fund the social services, as Keith suggested, at full, there'd be a hundred thousand left, roughly for um, for the town and Valley CDC's proposal. I I I kind of like that because I took into consideration Andrew's comment about you know small businesses struggling, and it is it is going to give them money to pivot, but you know. Who knows the longevity of that? What's the return on the investment is going to be? I um, mean, again, that's not our priority, but I like the way that Keith has laid this out. Well, so and so I think there are three, right? So then there are sort of three clusters of issues we still need to work through. One is just about Valley CDC, and yes, how do we feel about that, right? So there's some real questions there, but we agree that's very important. The second is again this trade-off. If there's a trade-off, yeah, family outreach, Craig's doors, um, and uh, the uh, community connections. Uh, and then the third one is really that we just are inclined to feel differently about the domestic violence issue and the literacy project, right? But those are also smaller amounts of money. Comments? I mean, I feel like we should, that middle one about Craig's Doors, Amherst Community Connections, Family Outreach, and it's both about, you know, substantively, how do we feel about them and the trade-off and about how, you know, if we fund them all, that's likely to be received. That, that feels like a significant one we just need to come to grips with. And, and finally, if, I mean, I, I, I it, there seemed to be agreement with what I was suggesting with you know, if, if we do say family, we want to fund family outreach for a full-time position, that certainly gives us a significant start, right? If we say that makes sense, then what does that mean? What are the implications for what Craig's Doors proposes to do and what ACC proposes to do and what we should give them then? But the clientele that would go to, uh, to Craig's Doors <coughs> or Amherst Community Connections are kind of are they they're interchangeable you know if you have need you could go to Craig's stores or you could go to Amherst Community Connections you wouldn't be turned away at either also family outreach right and especially given the fact that Nate questioned everybody as to whether it mattered whether you were an individual or a family uh, Nate I see Alyssa Brewer has her hand raised oh sure so I was taking some notes Alyssa you're um, you're allowed to talk you just have to unmute yourself Hi, everybody. Alyssa Brewer. I'm sorry, this is super awkward because I'm not representing the town council. I used to be on the select board and I'm now on the town council, but back when I on select board days, Nate remembers me from coming to block grant advisory committee meetings. And I, I just want to put in the plug. I understand the town council has no role in this. We have been copied on the many letters for many different agencies and that's great and we super appreciate all the work you guys are delving into on this and we're also still trying to recruit you another member but that all aside i really feel like you guys are focused on the things that you're comfortable with which are the kinds of agencies that you always fund which is terrific i'm not hearing a comfort level and I, in fact i think it was directly expressed that there wasn't a comfort level with the micro business grants keith specifically said i don't think that's enough money to make a difference to anybody so if if you think that's a bad program then fund it at a small amount but i would argue that this is one of the very limited times we get the opportunity to help the business community in a different way and I think it's a huge missed opportunity if you say well we have to maximize all the social service agencies that happen to have applied during this round which in fact are incredibly similar to what they do every year when we have to pick and choose between the five agencies so I understand the appeal of saying wow we don't have to be limited to five but at the same time, I reflect back to the earlier part of your conversation where you were saying, you know, this is a competitive grant. 
this is a different thing. We don't know what lens CHCD is going to look at through this. And if they say, you know what, they put a very small amount into this micro enterprise thing that we think is important at the state level. I, I just not really sure these people are getting it. They can do their block grant stuff again another year. So I would just really caution you to question perhaps the town manager, uh, the assistant town manager more about how that program's supposed to work. You know, maybe they you didn't explain it effectively enough. And of course it is new. So you don't have any track history the way you do with other things. But I'm really nervous about the competitiveness of our grant just because of all we've been through in the past. So thanks so much for listening. And again, not an official position of the town council just based on my history. Thanks. Thank you. Well said. Yeah. yeah I will say to Alyssa's point, somewhat related, the DHD said they were going to try to make this easy for communities and streamline, you know, environmental review and income certifications and everything. And that actually caused more confusion on a conf at the conference call last week. Everyone's saying, what do you mean? It, it sounds like you want to make it easy, but now we have so many questions because it's different than what we've always done. And, um, and then, you know, DC kind of laughed because, you know, it's, you take a pretty rigid program and now they're trying to, I want to say be somewhat flexible and change priorities and it's just not what we're used to. So um, I agree the state has not promoted micro enterprise assistance necessarily the way it has other social services or housing in the last five to 10 years. And now all of a sudden they pivoted because of COVID and they realize that it is a priority. And so, um, you know, Valley's probably quite busy and same with Hilltown CDC and the others that Joanne mentioned. It's something that is, is you know, it's there, um, there are a lot of new programs um, developing because of the, the um, emergency and the you know the funding is now available. Also, when you think about it, all of these nonprofits can do fundraising on their own, and small businesses in town don't have that capacity unless someone sets up sets up a GoFundMe for them. Um, they do have the bid in the chamber, but typically retail businesses don't do their own fundraising because they're for profits, and these nonprofits um, can have mailing lists and they have other areas where they can go look for grants. So I do, um, and also I'm again advocating for helping a small business who is already existing and who can help itself the same way I feel about the literacy project where you're helping people help themselves. So Nate, can we see that? Yeah, can we see the error? Uh, yeah, I was just about to, uh, this one right here, uh, Andrew. Yeah. So yeah, I can, you know, let me just, the screen's really cluttered. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Um, working on that. Let's see if I can. So if we found what was just said persuasive, right, then we're back to sort of the ones in, in column C. It's a little too much, here we go. Thanks, Nate. All right, we're back to column C, where, yeah, Valley CDC, uh, Survival Center, and uh, FOA are fully supported. And we have $31,000 left. All right, so yeah, let me just, okay, Keith, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Andrew, let me just type what you said here. Uh. All these typing, I think we can make the case that um, Family Outreach, uh, Amherst Community Connections, and Craig's Doors do in fact serve different populations. One is homeless, transitioning to shelter. <coughs> One is household operations. And the other is ongoing survival needs for people on the edge. Uh, I think those are very clear lines and a presentation outlining those would be relatively easy to make if, if we were asked to do that. Um, 
as far as lowering the funds for Valley CDC, um, again, we don't know number of businesses possibly supported. We don't know to what level of support. And I will tell you that what a small business owner would have to do with any funds is either let it sit in the checking account just to have reserves, or they're going to use these funds to meet their survival needs. I don't know that immediacy of impact um, due to COVID, we're basically giving individuals assistance, not small businesses assistance. And if we're going to support individuals, mm -hmm. I think we have organizations mm -hmm. in town that have the demonstrated capacity to do that. Um, and again, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of ambiguity around who would benefit and how they would benefit from the CDC program. And I, I, I hear what I hear what Keith is saying, and you know, I, I think that's a relevant viewpoint. I think what troubles me is that you know the the state and the town have already come out and said this is a priority for this type of a program. So I guess I feel less comfortable about you know substituting my judgment about the importance of that. Um, you know, when the state and the town have already said this is a high priority and they've created this program, you know, roughly half of the program around um, micro enterprise. Yeah, but the who and the how. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm living a life right now where politicians say a lot of buzzwords around small business, a defined small business. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot of well-intended proposals and well-intended programs, but there's such vagueness and ambiguity as to the execution that the execution never has the desired impact. But we have organizations that have a proven track record of impact, ones that we have felt comfortable with in the past, and ones that we have no qualms of whether or not they can continue to deliver that impact. Setting aside $100,000 for the microenterprise program, I think is a good enough number. But I think fully funding the social services that can have impacts the day we cut these checks is what these, uh, these funds should be used for. But I think if I understand the situation, and I, and I may not, and I understand certainly what Matt, what you said, which I'm very much inclined to agree with, I think the, the issue isn't so much, you know, are there legitimate questions about the efficacy of the microenterprise program? There are questions. I think the issue is, or the issue I think we're grappling with is, would we actually prejudice, you know, our application if we don't support the microenterprise program in a significant way? Right. Would they look at, you know, if we suggested $100,000, would they say, these folks don't get it, we're not going to support that? I mean, is that the question? Well, that's not something we can answer. A, we yeah. don't know who's making that judgment, and we don't know what their criteria will be for judging the, the applications from the municipalities. What we also should try to do is put forth a presentation based on the needs of our community and the ability to um, respond to the needs that have arisen out of this, uh, this virus. Can I say, <laughs> say something here? Go ahead, Paul. The um, issue for me, you know, I'm, I'm feeling that it is vague. There are some things about how the Valley CDC and the town is going to do this uh, project. And that, and, but my bigger concern is that um, basically that well, Craig's door, we don't know that they've, that how they'll do with this because they've never um, done this, you know, this time of the year for one thing. And um, it's a, it would be a new thing that, that they're trying to step into. Amherst Community Connections 
was funded based on um, you know, a budget that was presented at the last round of, of funding um, and $44,000 of that didn't, wasn't real. 47. Yeah, 47. And the, and the money that's being requested is just to, to replace that. It's nothing new. Um, so, it, and it, you know, I don't know that we should use that money and it would be obvious also at the review at the state level that that's happening, um, which I think would have an impact on the whole grant in that it would look as if, um, it, you know, the money was being doled out in a way that was filling a gap that existed prior to the COVID uh, issues. Does it, does it make sense to flesh out the spreadsheet here, you know, kind of different approaches and then see how many of us, you know, support each one and are there, you know, can we start narrowing the... That's what I was going to say, Nat, to, to explore each of these four possibilities and see either massage one of them to make it fit or massage or look at look at all of them and adjust each of them accordingly. So do we want to go through and with these? Yeah, Gail, there's uh, Joanne Campbell has her hand raised and uh, Gabrielle, I'm assuming from the bid, has her hand raised if you'd like to recognize them. Are we still taking comments or do we want to just? Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, it's still the hearing. I think we could if Joanne has, is going to speak to the program. Okay. Sure. Joanne, I'll allow you to talk. Hi. So I, I just wanted to explain that we have ran a program like this. And so I just want to briefly, briefly say that when the city of Northampton uh, was using some of its own entitlement CDBG money that it had gotten through CARES, that um, my staff and I worked on this proposal uh, to get this application for the businesses. And we turned that around in about two weeks we had the applications online for small businesses to apply to uh, and upload their documents by April 15th. Uh, we had 80 applications by May 1st um, and all the money was awarded um, by uh, April 28th. And then the city did grant agreements and then they had to of course process uh, the checks through the city um, and then people will, the businesses will have to um, submit receipts, invoices of the products or services that they've purchased in order for them, in the case of Northampton, was sort of a pivot. So if a restaurant was closed, now they were doing curbside pickup. They, what did they need in order to do that? Were people ordering different kinds of things? If, if a shoe store was now putting everything online, they needed better website development. So it's a, it can be done very quickly. And we have spent uh, quite a few number of weeks in thinking through all these kinds of things. And I know it's probably not relevant now, but we left the application up on our website, valleycdc.com under the business, because a lot of organizations who are doing micro business counseling, Greenfield, Fitchburg, we have all been talking to each other and sharing information. Greenfield used a lot of our information in order to put their information together. They're running um, a micro business program now with reprogrammed CDBG money, but of course they're going in as well. So there is this, you know, which is not typically what you see in, in CDBG because they have not focused on micro enterprise for probably more than 10 years, but there is a community out here who work with businesses constantly, mostly counseling and some loans, but this is a grant program. And so we also took a look at was the, what was what the business asking for, was it reasonable that they were still going to be around? Now we, that's not a hundred percent, of course, but um, we do have our small business counselor. She's been in business herself for 25 years before she started working for us. So we do, besides doing the income eligibility on, on a small business, we are also doing a business review on what they're asking for and what they expect that money will do for their business. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions or, um, but I can direct people to our website. It's very clear. We have a bunch of um, questions, so, but this would be slightly different because Northampton was doing, was doing uh, 10 or less employ uh, business employees. Thank you. Well, it says her hands up, Nate. Uh, Gabrielle, Gabrielle, I'm, I'm gonna allow you to speak now. You can. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you. And I know that this is running over your time. I just wanna reiterate the unprecedented, na unprecedented nature of these micro, this micro grant being part of these funds and how important that is um, based on just the, the unbelievable trauma that COVID-19 has created for our small businesses. Our small businesses um, that would be eligible for this meet the percentage of the average median income as business owners. They are the businesses here who um, employ, they are employees, they are entrepreneurs. If we do not support them in some way, shape or form and keep them running, they are sadly going to end up most likely being on the lines of the social services that you guys are supporting so regularly and so wonderfully. Um, I just wanna stress that these funds are enough. They are enough to keep them, to sustain them through this period. They are enough to help get their rents paid and their backlogged employment paid. And it is the hope that will keep them fighting to stay open. And this, this is the gap. This can close the gap for them. Um, these funds are so important. And we've seen it because we've raised money to do this for these businesses. We've given it to them. And $2,500, $5,000, $10,000, these are the gap funds they need and nobody else is coming to give these to them. They have no grant opportunities. They are not 501c3s. They cannot go after the Bar Foundation. Uh, the PPP is way too complicated and it's too scary for many, especially of our non-English speaking business owners and our minority business owners. It's, it's too much. So I just really, this is the first time I've spoken at these meetings and I really wanted to put in a plug for this again, unprecedented micro grant fund from these funding sources and how important it is that we take advantage of this is, I hope is a once in a lifetime thing that small businesses are having to come and look for funds like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who else has their hands up? Uh, Wei-Ling and Kevin Noonan. Let's see. Um, um, Wei-Ling, you can uh, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'll be very brief. I really appreciate the insight that Keith shared with all of us. Um, I think Kevin Nuna would agree with me that Craig stores working with people, they are homeless. They need help just to stay alive by having a shelter for them. And yet they are hoping that with the resource center, they will be able to help people not have to come to the shelter next winter. And us, Emerson, community connections, we are helping people who are out of the shelter and they have a glimpse of hope to get into stable housing through our Housing First program, through our rental subsidy program. And this program is housing based without a support service. Their chance of not going back to the shelter will be slim. And the Family Outreach of Amherst helping families who have already a roof over their head, but they have challenges unable to meet their rent utility obligations. So we have different populations we serve depending on their housing on the continuum. So I want to suggest that the world know if you are homeless on the street, you are very different from the people who have a roof over their head and yet you are not able to pay your rent. So <clears> they <throat> are different. So in terms of plugging our hole, budget hole, money is fungible. And we provide support service to the community at a tune of 800 unique individuals every year. So we will continue to help. And now we are expecting the number might go up, but we are expecting the needs will be much deeper. And with that 800 people we serve, and we ask for $37,000 in the previous grant that you were so kind to give it to us. But because the funding world is such, they change their priority. So we are impacted. And the impact on us means that we will have to serve less of the people. We are unable to do the deep diving into their needs to help them get out of the hole. <clears throat> so whether you agree or not, 
we are just struggling like the Craig stores, like family outreach events, like every single nonprofit organization, we need a lifeline and we don't have the business you know, administration that we can go apply for funding. You are our only source of funding here when it comes to COVID-19 special funding. I can't think of any other entity I could go ask to apply for a small grant. I don't. And you are my lifeline. You are the lifeline of the people we work with. So I'm gonna ask you really sincerely, please think about the dollar impact you have will be 10 times of the benefit they are gonna reap in our agency's perspective. Thank you. Well, who else? Thank you, Wayling. Nate, oh. two, two more people. Uh, Kevin, um, hold on, let me just. Hand. All right, Kevin, uh, wait, hold on a minute. Kevin, uh, you're allowed to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify a couple of points. Um, one is Family Outreach has submitted a grant with two options for you. They, they, they said they would accept a part-time case manager as well as a full-time case manager. So that seems to be relevant that the agency itself is willing to accept either or and still consider themselves to be effective. That should be considered a good point, I think. So you don't, you're not obliged to fund only one agency at a full-time position if they're asking you to do either. And then secondly, if it's, you know, we're small businesses too, uh, particularly ACC and Craig Storage. So $6,000 is, is something that is uh, helpful to a small business in Amherst. Well, certainly whatever's left, if you can be divided up equally among the three agencies with social services, it's gonna be significant to us. We do have the ability to fundraise, but competition for that, especially in COVID-19 is very, very high. And then finally, it's not something that I've never done. I've been doing this for 30 years, so I don't know, maybe Paul and I should sit and have coffee, but uh, it's not like we don't, have, we don't have capacity to do this. We, we certainly do, it's not rocket science. We have people who are homeless who wanna get them a house so that they don't end up populating shelters and spreading COVID. That's the primary reason we're doing this. So I, again, I know you guys have a lot to do and be brief, so I'll stop here, but it just seems fair to, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that the town manager in the town, given the, their presence of the assistant town manager and Melissa Brewer, they want you to fund the microenterprise thing. You're pretty much already decided to fund the survival center at their total amount. Just look at the rest and be fair. That's all we're asking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any, are we all through with comments for the moment? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, can we use that? So it sort of feels to me like we're being tugged in all these different directions. And um, I think our overarching concern is what the state will look at as a um, well thought out proposal from us. So can I go back one more time and just question from you, Nate, about if we um, fund Family Outreach, Community Connections, and Craig Stores, is that going to jeopardize us? Or um, can we establish that each organization meets different needs of the population during this crisis? I think, um, you know, Keith said that you could explain that they serve different populations. I do agree. At the same time, I could see the state saying, well, why are we paying three overhead and admins you know, uh, administrative costs when could there be one agency that could just do this all right now in this emergency? So, you know, um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why, um, how the state will look at it. You know, we would, we would do our best to explain, uh, you know, why the three, why it's effective to use the three organizations and, and how they're leveraging donations and, um, you know, are not, you know, as you said, they, you know, they're not necessarily bloated budget. So, um, you know, I, I think we make it work for the town. I just, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think that this, this isn't a typical block grant round. So they're, they're not asking for the committee or towns to say, well, let's fund all social services because we can. What they're saying is if um, usually there's a dollar cap or a, a number of activities, right, that are capped in a grant. So this is being amended to our 19 grant. So we already funded five social services. So any agency we fund beyond that is already over the cap. The, um, 
you know, I think what they're really looking at is what are the programs that address impacts from COVID? And, you know, can we say that the um, proposals recommended do that? I think that's really the focus, not necessarily, you know, do we need to fund all of them? It's just, are the ones that are being recommended, you know, can they deliver? Can they make an impact? Can they help? Um, so I just, you know, we're already, in terms of this is, so this is being amended for everyone listening to, this is being amended to our 2019 grant uh, under which we've already funded five social service agencies. So if we add just one more or more dollars, we're already over our, what is our typical cap? So DHCD just said for this COVID funding, there's no cap. That way communities don't have to be worried about, you know, are we more than a certain percentage or more than a number, um, a number of activities. Um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, I think we would, you know, I, I, you know, the town would make it work the best we could. Um, I do think they are similar. I do think we could say they serve different populations. I, you know, I, um, they are addressing a, a priority that DHCD isn't, um, has, a, you know, has identified. So I don't, it's probably not as helpful as you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I make a suggestion to the committee that if we take model one or model two with Valley CDC, um, Amherst, um, the Survival Center, the Literacy Project, actually I'm on the model two, the yes. second one down, that's, that totals 389. What if we funded Valley CDC at 200 and then that left us 11, that leaves us $12,000, um, $14,000 extra and then gave 7,000 to Craig stores and $7,000 to Amherst Community Connections. So it's something but it's fully funding friends, um, family outreach. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not clear uh, why $100,000 is not sufficient to fund the micro enterprise program. Well, we know it would limit the number of businesses that would get funding but we don't know the number of businesses that are gonna request funding. I think in the, in the proposal, they had um, you know, provided an estimate of the... It says 22 micro businesses would be served with $200,000. Right, and they, but they also estimated um, 20 to 30 businesses would meet the eligibility. In other words, the, the low income, as well as the, you know, no more than four or whatever, employees so um i think if they've looked they've looked at this and i think they you know they made a reasonable assumption right keith i think the one thing that did change from when that what the original application is dhcd has allowed um a town to design their program um guidelines so that income eligibility could be based on a three-month um uh, a three month calculation, say starting April 1 to July 1. So it's not based on a prior year tax return. So that actually opens up more businesses to being income eligible. So to me, that makes me think that probably any um, micro enterprise in Amherst would be eligible. So it's no longer based solely on tax returns. So I think that that opens it up to a lot more businesses being able to apply for funding. Yeah. You no, know, I. I don't know the number, but I just I just know that it'll it can open up the possibility of more. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah. So the the uh, comments about the uh, CDC is has actually um, sort of swung me even more towards funding them in full because being grant money and the size of the um, businesses in, and the um, income eligibility for the last three months would make quite a few eligible and everybody is going to have to learn how to use uh, the technology for offline business and the small businesses are the most likely ones not to have the technology the equipment that they need to really do that right and this could be a perfect grant for them to go get the what they need to access the world to sell their products as well as walk-ins when the doors open. So that was, that is just my thought. 
Also, we have to take into consideration the impact of whether the university is going to be populated in the fall or not. And that's, you know, four months from now, but we don't, three months from now, well, two and a half, whatever. We don't really know what's going to happen come Labor Day weekend if students are coming back. So um, the, these micro enterprises really need this boost. Mm -hmm. We need somebody to make a, 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 a proposal here. We've been on the phone for two and a half hours. I think we're all getting phone fatigue. Well, so does it, does it make sense? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm I'm really energized right now. Just, <laughs> does it does it make sense to you know flesh out say I don't know three of these three proposals and then see how many people support each one and start eliminating and see where that leaves us. See if we can get you know a large enough majority to support. Well, we can yeah. first time just go down the list and raise our hands and see what see what that looks like. See how close we are. Well, do we want to eliminate any before we we have one, two, well, we have five that. scenarios? Do we want to? Are there okay. any that that we know off the bat that we want to eliminate? Oh, bring us back to Excel, please. Sure. Okay, so I'll uh, that again. The last scenario, uh, budgetary scenario, wasn't, you know, it was just, yeah, so the last one in C. This one. No, uh, no, the, the, yeah, that one that your cursor's on now, right? So that suppose, yeah, well, the three things you see, yep. um, which would, and then the, again, obviously we have 31,000 left. Um, The, you know, I, I wonder, so um, Gail, you had mentioned, okay, so you've put a, a strong plug in for um, the literacy project. And of course it's, it's, that's a, one of the smaller ones. There's a domestic violence project. I'm not sure if we heard from everybody on that. Um, I'm not saying we should go the way of convenience, but it occurs to me that those two together are $30,000. Right, and we have thirty-one thousand dollars left. Um, it does, you know. We've heard people argue too for, and Gail, you've done it, and so for splitting. You know, it feels odd to me to give seven thousand dollars to a program that asks for fifty-seven. You know, seven thousand dollars to a program that asks for forty-seven. Um, you know, if there isn't a strong feeling about supporting one or the other, I'd feel better about supporting the ones that ask, you know, giving, yeah, giving $10,000 to the one that asked for 10, 20 to the one that asked for 20, so they can at least do what they asked for, um, as opposed to giving, you know, what feels like a very small amount to groups that ask for much more, but that may, mm. that, that may not be right. But, but I guess, you know, if we want to make this, Nate, into a proposal, the one that you have highlighted there, you know, I would throw in, yeah, 24 literacy project, 10 or 11 for the domestic violence program, in which case we're obviously putting all our, you know, eggs into the FOA basket. Isn't that, isn't that then the same as the top proposal there? It is. Woohoo! It is the same. But yeah, I think I think that you know, yeah. Obviously, we could divide that extra thirty-one in in different ways. I could live with that. But of the ones proposed, that's that's the one that I would vote for if we were to vote on it right now. That's the allocation I would support. Comments? Andrew, if you just said I move, <laughs> what I just said, I I, I, I would at least get it. I could get either a second, or it would be it wouldn't go anywhere. But at least it's something to then have a discussion on. Move, Andrew, move. Okay, no, <laughs> I will. I will move. I will move, and then we'll see if anyone seconds me. I move. Now it's that top left corner there that yeah. I think Andrew described. Yes, and I I would second that. Wait. Technically, it's a thousand dollars short, but uh, TLP is actually twenty thousand four hundred. 
Yeah, that was a rough. I mean, we we will just we can I yeah. can make it so it's the full some rounding there. Do we need to take a vote beyond the second? Yeah, I know. Um, usually we do a vote um, um, via roll call on Zoom, but so I you know I, I just want to make sure that we've exhausted the discussion. If people have questions, we can. It doesn't need to go to a vote if, unless there's people want to. Uh, I think it would be good to go to a vote. I mean, to take it, to ask people mm -hmm. yay or nay. All right, Gail, if you want to call it, then you could. Uh... So um, all in, f do, do we have to do it individually by person? Individually, right, yeah. Okay. Paul, are you amenable to um, the motion that's on the table right now? Okay. Can I note one thing? Sure. That actually all of these, there are really only two, <laughs> we have five things written up there, but there are actually only two choices. The one we've highlighted and the one that Keith suggested. The others are actually all pretty, mu pretty much the same, right? Simil yeah, very similar. Yes. Very similar. So we haven't, for example, produced one where, yeah, Craig's doors and um, Amherst Community Connection, right, get, yeah, that we really do split money across those three. It was just, it, this one had that. That, that was mine. No, I know. That was no, that's, that's only, okay. No, I'm I, just saying that's the only right. other, we only really have two budgets up there, right. two allocations up there. So, you know, I'm wondering, does anyone want to propose a third allocation that is, you know, meaningfully different than these? And, uh, and if not, then should we, yes, we could just vote on these two, if we're satisfied with these being the essential alternatives. But we do have a motion. So can we okay, first yeah. take the roll call on the motion? In a second. So, okay. um, yeah. Are you taking notes by hand, Nate? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Usually I type, but it's hard to type and then do everything else. Yeah, I need an extra set of hands. Zoom, Zoom does a transcript. I may actually see if I can use it from this meeting. <laughs> there you go. The long one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell me when you're ready. I'm all set, so. Um, okay, um, so Paul, there's a motion on the table, so on the floor, to yeah. um, ex accept yeah. or um, reject the proposed budget that we see up on the top left corner yeah. that totals, it's the only one on the Excel sheet that totals 399, yay or nay? Okay, so just to be clear, that's the Valley CDC, the Amherst Survival Center, yeah. uh, the uh, Learning Literacy, Pro Learning Literacy Project, mm -hmm. uh, and the PVPC, and family outreach. Correct. Yeah, I would go with that. Thank you. Julie noted. Uh, Nat proposed it. Andrew seconded. I have the order. So Keith, you're our next person. Oh, well, we still want to have Nat and uh, Andrew take a vote. Oh, okay. Even though they put the motion, made the motion. Maybe they, maybe they changed their mind. <laughs> maybe they just did it to further the, sometimes you second just to further the discussion. <laughs> okay, I'm going down the line. Andrew? I'm supportive of that, yes. Thank you. Nat? Yes. Keith? No. Okay. Um, do you want to discuss? I just do not feel uh, devoting half of these funds to an ambiguous micro enterprise program that I think is very well intentioned, but the immediacy of impact um, is just undefined. The level of uh, support per applicant is unknown. The <laughs> use of funds per applicant, we don't know, and, and there's no feedback mechanism to, to know that those funds are being used for the desired purposes. Um, but we know that there are households and individuals that have been suffering and have been overwhelmingly impacted by this virus. And we have the capacity and the expertise in our social service community to meet their needs. 
And I think we should set aside some funding. I, I definitely think some money toward that microenterprise program, whatever it is going to be, is fine. But I think the ask made of each organization is based on their understanding of their need. It's not a fictitious number. And to not fully fund those applications at the levels requested because of concern about how the, the judges at the state <laughs> panel may view the application, I think is um, not what we should do. Okay. But again, Nate emphasized that the state could look at the Craig Stores Family Outreach and Amherst Community Connections as duplication of efforts. Um, and, and that's even, not the basis for my decision at all. I don't know if it is for everybody else, but it has nothing to do with my decision. Okay. Um, Gail, you, Gail, you haven't voted, so. I'm I'll... always the, the last one to go. Um, I always vote one way and then I go home and don't sleep at night because um, <laughs> I feel it. Um, I can live with this proposal um, with a 399. I mean, there's so much need in the community. And again, I think my reasoning, and not that it really matters, is I think that nonprofits, again, have the capacity to go out and fundraise and do a letter writing campaign or um, a GoFundMe. And businesses don't raise money. Businesses make money because they're not nonprofits. So I can live, I vote yay on the, three, the total of 399. All right, thanks everyone. That wasn't really an easy decision. The, um, there's still a number of attendees I'd like to thanks. I have one quick question. Oh yeah. What micro business is truly making money if the owners still qualify for assistance? All of them because none of them have been open. So they're income eligible. But are we going to, well, that just answers my question. Like how is this being executed? If I say that I started a business less than a year ago, but I have nothing that looks like a business, but I say I'm my only employee, I apply for funds, I get funds, okay? I don't know. It, it, it's yeah. I think we're in I think the well intended. We're in the point of guessing on on what their needs are. We have to have some faith in this group that has done it for twenty years. Right, we wouldn't, like Valley said, they, you know, you do screen um, applicants, so there is some parameter. So it's not like you could have a business that just started, um, you know, at the beginning of this year asking for funding um, necessarily. So, I, you know, there are some unknowns with this program. Um, what what I was going to say to this, I was going to thank everyone for sitting through this. And, you know, there is a vote. So it seems like, you know, that's, that's the, those are the recommendations. I can transmit that to the town manager's office. and um work with the town manager's office on submitting an application to the state the um you know i think that it was a really thorough discussion and um i you know i, I do thank the committee i don't i think it's a difficult decision to uh, you know to decide who who gets funded and who doesn't when you know like andrew said all the proposals were strong so i, I thank everyone for that for the your your you know your thoughtful consideration Okay. I don't know, Gail, um, you know, is, would, are, is everyone comfortable with that? I guess we, if, if so, we can um, okay. ask for one more round of public comment, if you'd like, and then so, we'd so close the meeting Nate, or... Nate, can I just, so when you um, write it up, mm -hmm. um, there will actually will be 700 left over, I believe. I think the, um, I mean, we'll, you know, we'll make the budget work. There is some admin money we could put in there. There's, um, you know, if we need to put 700 toward one proposal, we can do that. Not to me, that's not, you know, if there are, if there are a few thousand left over, I would ask the committee to help with that. But, you know, the town manager could make a recommendation on that 700. Okay. Yeah. And, and I have to just ask, is there a chance that the town manager would disagree with our recommendation and then what happens? Let's say he doesn't like the fact that, you know, we didn't fund two, two agencies helping with um, homeless issues. Would it come back to us or would he just, you know, reconfigure the map? 
it would just, I think given the time frame and this type of money it would just be the town manager's decision and okay. the town's decision. Um, I mean, you know, we, I think the committee goes through a really thoughtful process so that, you know, we're, we're you know, the staff are well, well aware of this decision making process. So, you know, he respects that. Um, but, you know, there wouldn't be, you know, DCD is not asking for, you know, another public hearing and then, you know, there isn't time to do that kind of iterative process. So, so Nate, you just asked now about comments during this meeting currently or, or another one? Well, right now, I mean, there's still a lot of people in attendance, so I just wasn't sure if we want to have any more public comment, Gail, or if you feel like that we've had enough. Um, I think two hours and three quarters. We've done. I mean, we really have heard from everybody and right. everybody had an, an adequate chance to speak. Um, we asked for new information. We got a little bit of new information and I think we, this was a very thorough and thoughtful process and it's never easy. It's not easy. Sure. But I think we look, um, I think we dot our I's and cross our T's pretty thoroughly. So at, the, at the risk of painting you, at the considerable risk of painting you, I'm going to just ask one last question. Um, the, the 66 as um, I'm forgetting who it was, uh, Family someone outreach spoke up. No, no, but as someone noted, of course, they did ask for a full time. You know, they offered the full time, part time possibility. <clears throat> we were sufficiently impressed. I think certainly I was that I said, "Oh, I'd love them to have a full time because I think they'll do very good work and they can cover all kinds of areas." We could, you know, the we could give uh, fund them at the half at the part time position, which would free up you know thirty something thousand dollars that we could reallocate. Uh, I don't think we've expressly talked about that issue once we thought, yes, ideally we would fund them at the full time. So I at least want to raise that. Is that something worth considering? I think, no, I, I think the strongest argument comes from the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Chair, John Hornick, who you know, for the $250,000 that they have to provide, they need a social service agency to work with, and they really want one, right, that can handle this. So the more resources we can give to family outreach to have a full-time person to really um, allow them to um, the partner with the you know, affordable housing trust seems to me like I think he has a really, really good point. Thank you. Now. Okay, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Are we ready to call this or do we have to uh, address raised hands? Committee, uh, it's a, I guess it's a few, Gail. You know, you already said there was no more comment. It's almost six. You know, we'd have, we'd have to have a motion to adjourn and then, uh, you know, that's- I'll make a motion to adjourn. Seconded. And then I guess a roll call to adjourn if you want to do it that way. I, touch, touch your nose if you want to adjourn. Then we know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, we don't know what you're doing. Okay, we're done. Hey, Keith is, must be tired right now. He's probably yeah. holding the baby. That's why he doesn't have his, his, yeah. his, audio, his video up. All right, so that's, so, um, all right, so we'll say that the vote was to adjourn. And thanks everyone. Thank thanks you. everyone for listening. I'll, I'm gonna end the meeting in a minute. So thanks everyone for, uh, hang in there for almost three hours. And uh, yeah, thanks, Cody. Oh, thank you, Nate. This is where the hard work begins for you. Uh, yeah, this is fine. It gives me something to do for a week. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you get out of the bedroom once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't leave my room. No. <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.